Okay, thank you for attending everyone. Um, so my job today is to convince you that you can uh, get just as good a results from your point of care device as you can from your local laboratory. Josh and Terry are then going to tell you how to make sure that happens. So point of care testing, um, point of care has been around for quite some time. Uh, and in fact, lab testing evolved from point of care, not the other way around. And then comes the age of machines. The uh, reflectance glucose meter you can see on the left of your screen is approximately 40 years old. Uh, the glucose meter on the right is the current state of the art and can give you results in a matter of seconds and is able to transmit directly into the EMR. Uh, you, a lot of people online are familiar with our um, common handheld devices. All of these are battery powered. Then we move into the larger benchtop blood gas type instruments, but they're still considered point of care. Point of care being testing done near the patient. So how do we get good quality point of care results? Well, we have some quality systems uh, to monitor the procedures and processes, quality control to make sure the systems, devices, cartridges, operators are all working as they're intended. And I uh, know everybody loves their quality control samples and their quality assurance, which is a check that everybody is able to get a similar result for the same sample and the same test. Um, measurement uncertainty, this is a concept uh, about an estimate of how repeatable a result is. It, it's a requirement that every pathology service or every pathology test that gives a quantitative result in Australia as an accreditation uh, requirement it must have an MU calculated. Um, doesn't take into account the pre-analytical variabilities that we're going to be discussing today. It's really only looking at the analytical concept with a notable exception that we're about to find out. And for the, my talk, it gives me the advantage that I can compare two different ways of doing the same test. So blood gas testing, almost exclusively a point of care test, and that's because of the uh, pre-analytical instability of the sample, makes it uh, point of care an advantage over actually sending it to the lab. Um, so blood gases, respiration, uh, blood is very good at exchanging and delivering gas, primarily oxygen and carbon dioxide. That ability though uh, causes the, in the sample instability. So oxygen it's only really of interest in a arterial collection, but then it's of great interest. Usually a large difference between tension in the blood and tension in the atmosphere, but that assists in the exchange of, uh, of the oxygen. Precision-wise, looking at this table, the ISTAT uh, appears not to perform as well as the other two blood gas machines, and that's because of the... Uh, pre-analytics in delivering the QC and QAP samples to an ISTAT cartridge compared to getting a, the sample into those other blood gas machines. Um, a bit of trivia there for you to have a look at. Some more trivia. Symptoms of altitude sickness for most people begin about 2,500 metres above sea level. Mount Kosciuszko is only 2,228 metres so we're not going to see any altitude sickness while we're in Australia. Base Camp Everest is 5,380 metres and the PO2 is approximately half of that of sea level, so about 83 millimetres of mercury for the inspired oxygen partial pressure. So not a place you can go and visit in a, on a day trip. Um, as I said, large variations in pressure cause a rapid exchange of gas. The cyclone analogy I've used here probably 
what happens in our QC, QAP samples. Things happen very, very quickly there. Blood doesn't change quite so quickly and um, the it's probably more like a stiff breeze in comparison, but if we do have air bubbles, air space in a syringe or in a tube, then an exchange of oxygen, carbon dioxide is going to occur. Carbon dioxide, this is the other gas we measure and are of interest in. Um, we breathe out, of course, and want to lose, the blood wants to lose our carbon dioxide. So, again, the oxygen, uh, the ISTAT, appears inferior but uh, the same uh, explanation about pre-analytic supplies for carbon dioxide as oxygen. pH forms part of our blood gas acid base analysis. Um, again the ISTAT appears not to be as precise as the other two instruments but carbon dioxide being a uh, dissolved carbon dioxide being carbonic acid that Influence, that pre pull influence is still there for pH. L lactate. Um, so we're moving more into the chemistries now. While still very unstable pre-analytically, pre um, not sufficient to show up between the, the delivery systems to these three blood gas machines. And as you can see, all very similar precisions, all producing very similar results. Sodium, um, so there's a little bit of a difference between how point-of-care instruments and the lab instruments measure sodium. Point-of-care uses a direct ion selective electrode technology. Most labs are using indirect IESEs. This will give a small variation between samples dependent on the state of hydration of the patient or the blood. In general, uh, you could say a hemodiluted patient such as is common in an ICU, we'd expect to see the lab sodium reading a little bit higher, one or two millimoles higher probably. Um, so here's a comparison of our three instruments. We've got the ISTAT compared to the lab, we've got a GEM compared to the lab and we've got the ABL compared to the lab. Um, I'll be skipping through several of these comparison graph presentations. The main thing of interest is this line diagonally through the middle here. That's where the results are equivalent. So point of care equals um, lab. And you can see there's a bit of noise on the sodium around here and you could attribute that to that indirect versus direct IFC technology difference. So potassium, potassium is very susceptible to pre-analytical issues. Um, the cells have to work hard to keep potassium inside. Uh, uh, as it says here, the concentration is much greater intracellular than extracellular, 100 to 150 millimoles versus 4 to 5. But we can see that the precision of both point of care and lab is very similar. Uh, in comparison, the, you can see all those points grouped around the line, a little bit of variation here, and I would venture to say this is pre-analytical error. These results are from real patients taken out of the EMR from uh, testing done last year. So when uh, point of care and lab coincide, when we can see the paired results. Um, glucose, well, both the lab and the point of care do glucose very well and equally well. Uh, to note here, these are the blood gas type of point of care instruments measuring glucose, not the handheld glucometers. We wouldn't expect to see that sort of precision in a glucometer where we're looking at uh, 2 to 3%, we're possibly looking more like 10% in a handheld glucometer. Uh, given that, 
not many glucoses are report, repeated in the lab. People seem very happy with their point of care glucose and their glucometer glucoses. And we can see that the um, results from the point of care compare very closely to what you'd expect to get back from your lab. Creatinine, uh, the, the lab does look better, especially on the higher sample here, but this is a lab running the latest uh, enzymatic creatinine method. The older Jaffa assays, not, not as precise, but still medically useful. Well, worth noting, all the assays, the ISTAT, the ABL, and the labs are all uh, approved for EGFR estimation. And so they're all giving medically and clinically useful results. Comparison wise, we can see that they compare almost identical. Hemoglobin, well, the ISTAT doesn't measure hemoglobin directly. It calculates it from a metacrit. The other three instruments do measure, uh, and the other two instruments in the lab do measure hemoglobin itself, and we can see that the ISTAT suffers because of that. Uh, in comparison, yeah, the the ABL and the GEM compare very closely to what we get back from the lab and quite tight, and you'd expect that because they're um, measuring it, measuring hemoglobin and the samples are being processed almost immediately. When we look at the ISTAT, we see all these points here. Um, probably pre-analytical issues of the sample not being mixed adequately. So, in summary, um, errors will occur with both types of testing. In the, in the laboratory, there is some screening of results before they're posted to the patient's record. The point of care doesn't have that sort of filter. The results go directly into the EMR. Also in the lab, there's a scientist required to notify any results that flag as critical uh, at point of care. It's up to the operator to um, be aware of their critical limits and recognise those results. But for both the uh, point of care and the laboratory, if, if a result doesn't fit the clinical assessment, um, it must be checked before it's being acted on. Don't believe everything that comes out of uh, a lab or a point of care instrument. Having said that, not always is the lab the source of all truth. So, a little while back we had a, a query from one of our point-of-care sites that were worried about potassiums they were seeing on a patient over the weekend. They were getting fairly normal results on their point-of-care and they were getting very high potassiums on samples they were sending to the lab. We did a little experiment between the facility and myself and uh, they collected uh, the patient the next day, um, ran it on their point of care, we got a result of about four and sent uh, split the sample, sent one tube at room temperature and one tube in the esky as they would normally send their bloods from Oberon to Bathurst and that's only a 40 minute journey. Um, and you can see the difference between just refrigerating the sample. And this is a, this is an example of why we say don't put your blood gas samples on ice anymore. One of the, one of the reasons, there are a couple of other reasons as well. So what happened? Um, for those who are curious, at low temperatures, the potassium pump, so the... the the NK, NKAPPAs goes to sleep. So that's the pump that makes sure the potassium stays within the cells. Um, so that's the end of my section. I'll now hand over to Josh.
Okay, thanks, Brian. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. So I'll be talking about uh, point of care and, and pre-analytical errors um, before Terry goes on to uh, uh, give us an overview of, of best practice for preventing these errors. So I'll be touching on the brain-to-brain -brain loop concept, uh, the pre-analytical steps in the loop, where errors occur, and the types of point of care errors. So tests are obviously part of the diagnostic process and are a fundamental product of pathology. The brain-to-brain -brain loop concept, it's not new, it was introduced uh, a few decades ago, um, but essentially it expands the concept of uh, a test from merely an analysis to a brain-to-brain -brain loop or a total testing process. So that states that the test really commences when a clinician has a clinical problem and isn't completed until the, the problem is solved. So all of the various steps in that loop from um, ordering the right test and, and collecting the sample and transporting it uh, are variables which should be controlled. Uh, so that's a, a picture of, of what we're meaning by the loop and the various steps uh, uh, in the total testing process. Uh, now this process can be broken down into three phases. The pre-analytical, the analytical, and the post-analytical. So the steps in the pre-analytical phase, uh, these include test, uh, test select, uh, uh, selecting the right test, uh, filling out the request form, did the patient require any specific preparation, um, the blood collection, using the right tubes, etc. The analytical phase, uh, that's uh, the assay performance and uh, uh, instrument uh, maintenance, etc. The post-analytical is how we go about uh, reporting the results and uh, whether there's an interpretive comment, whether those results are looked at and acted on appropriately. The pre-analytical phase, in a little bit more detail. So these are the steps occurring between the detection of a clinical problem and analysing the sample. So it can be broken down into technical factors, which we touched on, but also biological factors to do with age, gender, um, time of day, if the sample needs fasting, needs to be fasting, or, or intercurrent illness um, could affect the result as well. And certainly we understand that the steps from getting from a request to the results actually become a little bit more complicated. So where do most errors occur uh, in this testing process and why? So the majority actually occur in the pre-analytical phase. So there's uh, steps outside the lab. So certainly if we're interested in re reducing overall uh, pathology errors, uh, we should focus on the pre-analytical phase. And that's because the steps in the pre-analytical phase are often poorly monitored and evaluated, and sometimes the owner um, is unclear. It may fall between a boundary um, uh, between the lab and the clinical units. Only a small proportion are analytic, occur in the analytical phase, and that's because we've had improvements in reliability and standardization or assays and instruments. Um, we've introduced some automation and improvements in interfacing our analyzers uh, so results download automatically. But what about in point of care? So certainly point of care doesn't have the same transport and storage steps for samples that we send to the lab. But again, the majority of errors are occurring in the pre-analytical phase. Um, but it should be noted, uh, and should be noted that um, uh, the errors in the, the analytical phase of point of care have been reducing due to improvements in, in devices, certainly the devices we've been uh, implementing in New South Wales Health Pathology, and improvements in operator training, and the efforts that we go to uh, for QC and QAP monitoring. So what types of uh, point of care pre-analytical errors uh, are there? Well, some of the more common ones include patient identification errors, sample collection handling errors from poor phlebotomy technique, 
uh, clotting uh, samples, bubbles in, in blood gas samples, uh, venous blood contamination of arterial sample. Uh, there may be some delay in testing and prior to analysis, um, uh, inadequate mixing of the sample and not entering the sample type on the device uh, to get appropriate uh, reference intervals. So starting with po uh, patient identification errors, uh, so this is where we've got either missing uh, information or the wrong patient, or wrong blood in tube as, as it's termed. So certainly this is a potentially dangerous type of error uh, that can result in, at a minimum, recollection, but uh, otherwise could lead to incorrect diagnosis and treatment. So how can we prevent this? We need to ensure we're using positive patient identification, avoiding leading questions, uh, and also checking the patient's ID band. Point of care samples we recommend should have an ID label attached. Uh, and this is especially important if you're not the person uh, uh, doing the testing for the point of care. So if you're giving it to another person uh, to perform the testing. Uh, poor phlebotomy technique, so prolonged tourniquet. So this can cause some uh, changes due to ischemia, increasing lactate, and also hemoconcentration of the serum proteins, which uh, with tourniquet left on for uh, a number of minutes, uh, we can see increasing protein uh, as well as hemoglobin. Another phlebotomy technique uh, error is to do with incorrect order of draw, so the, the, uh, the order of um, collecting blood tubes. This can lead to contamination. Uh, one of the most notable examples is EDTA uh, contamination, so the purple top tubes. So uh, if that uh, contaminates uh, serum or gold top tube, uh, we've got an example of, of the type of results we might see. So the elevated potassium, this reflects potassium EDTA contaminant. And the EDTA uh, works by chelating uh, calcium. So we can see that's also been falsely lowered. Uh, dilution errors, another phlebotomy issue. This is where we're drawing a sample from a cannula or line, and it may become contaminated with uh, the flush due to in improper collection technique. So this may uh, uh, give uh, uh, falsely elevated sodium and chloride if it's a sodium chloride uh, saline flush and dilution of, of the other analytes. So how do we prevent uh, some of these uh, phlebotomy issues? So careful phlebotomy technique, um, avoiding prolonged tourniquet, using correct order of draw. Uh, so this uh, uh, generally involves collecting serum, uh, followed by plasma, and then finally your, your uh, purple and grey top tubes. Uh, and if collecting from a cannula, make, make sure you discard some blood if it's been uh, flushed or used, uh, and at least uh, uh, three times the dead space volume before collecting your samples. Hemolysis is another common problem. So the cells may might be lies in the sample due to poor collection technique, over, overly vigorous mixing, particularly of an underfilled tube, or putting samples directly on ice. The concern with point of care is that unfortunately in a whole blood sample you can't detect uh, a hemolyzed sample. So it's, it's really important to try and prevent it. The effects, the most dramatic effect is uh, increasing potassium, and the degree of elevation depends on the degree of hemolysis in the sample. So uh, this is just one illustration of uh, two samples from the one patient, one that was put directly onto ice, uh, therefore lysing some of the cells, causing a hemolyzed sample. We can see a dramatic uh, increase in the potassium pseudo-hypokalemia. So how to prevent this pre-analytical error? Careful phlebotomy technique, so avoid fist pumping, which can also contribute uh, avoiding turbulence in s sample collection, so rapidly aspirating through a na narrow uh, needle in a different difficult collection. Uh, it would be preferable to use the evacuated tube collection systems. Um, avoiding vigorous mixing or shaking of the sample and avoiding directly putting the sample on ice. 
Another error that's been is blood contamination of uh, arterial sample. So the effect here is lowering of oxygen parameters and increase, increasing uh, CO2. Uh, but note, venous blood can provide uh, sufficient info in certain clinical situations. And in general, the pH, pCO2 and bicarb are similar in a peripheral venous sample and arterial sample. The main difference is uh, PO2. Uh, and in uh, that setting, um, the venous blood is not helpful for assessing uh, oxygenation because the oxygen has already been extracted in the tissue. Air bubbles is another error. Uh, so uh, and this is problematic uh, in blood gas samples. So the effect here typically is elevation of the uh, oxygen parameters, decrease CO2. Uh, we also sometimes see this uh, with poor handling of our QAP samples. Uh, the degree of change depends on the baseline values, the size of the bubble, whether it was mixed through the sample, uh, um, and if you send that sample through the pneumatic tube, uh, the effect gets exaggerated. So how do we prevent that? So we try and handle our blood gas samples anaerobically, so uh, full tube, so don't have a gap at the end of your syringe, cap it immediately, test it promptly within 15 minutes. Um, you should check the sample for air bubbles, if present, tap to, to, to dislodge, and then expel them before mixing. And uh, vented tip caps allow expelling air while keeping the sample sealed. And generally, we try and avoid sending blood gas samples in the pneumatic tube as the oxygen is unreliable. Clotting, so this uh, clotting will occur if the sample is not mixed with anticoagulant. The clotting sample is no longer uh, homogeneous so a results aren't reliable. And a caution here is that clots can also damage or block the instrument, making it uh, um, unavailable for further testing. And clots can give uh, um, erroneous results as well. So we have seen that pulse uh, troponin I on the ISTAT uh, due to clotted samples. How can we prevent this error? So ensure we're using um, a sample with anticoagulant added, such as pre-heparinized syringes or lithium heparin tube, and mix the anticoagulant through the sample. So inadequate mixing, so red blood cells will settle out uh, when the blood is stored. Um, uh, again, the sample isn't uh, homogeneous, so the results are variable, but often we do see a falsely low hemoglobin. And again, uh, gentle mixing uh, before testing is important to prevent this. Prolonged storage, so delayed analysis, uh, the blood cells uh, uh, continue uh, metabolism, uh, affecting uh, various parameters. So again, for blood gas samples, it's important to test promptly. Um, there may be further delays, uh, may be acceptable for creatinine and troponin. And as Brian mentioned, uh, transport of blood gas samples on ice is no longer routinely re recommended. Um, as lowering the temperature increases the, pl the plastic syringe permeability to oxygen and you can uh, uh, run into trouble with uh, ice causing uh, red cells to lyse. So further information, so this is uh, a sheet from our, our green folders about some of these pre-analytical errors uh, if, if you're wanting further information. And in conclusion, uh, biochemical analysis is important for the investigation and management of most patients. Critical selection rather than a shotgun approach um, to test maximizes useful information. Uh, interdisciplinary cooperation inside and outside the lab is important as most um, or well, many of the, the vulnerable steps in the testing process are not under the direct control of lab staff. And the pre-analytical phase of the testing process for both point of care and lab testing is an important source of test errors that should be minimised. So I'll now hand over to Terry. There we go, thank you. Uh, okay, so in this last section of our seminar, I'll look at what a point of care operator should focus on to get the highest quality results that will assist in providing the best treatment for your patient. Some of this is pretty obvious and some will be a repeat of what Brian and Josh have already discussed. But we find if you get the basics right, then half your battle's already won. 
So I'll just quickly go over the five stages to getting a point of care result and highlight the sort of things that can influence the quality of those results. So as a point of care operator, you have minimal influence over the first and last stages of the process. That is the patient and the results analysis. The clinical history of the patient that arrives in your ward may be well documented or completely unknown. However, your standard board medical procedures will round up as much information as possible for the clinicians who will then interpret the point of care results you provide in light of the patient's presentation. But where you can have considerable influence on the quality of your patient's care is in the middle three stages. Uh, by avoiding common errors around the pre-collection, collection and testing phases. In the pre-collection stage, ensure you've identified your patient as you would for any other routine blood collection. And if you're using a device that's not quality controlled, you simply can't be sure the results are going to be correct. In this case, please contact pathology to see if that device can be included in our statewide point of care quality system. Collection is without doubt the stage with the most potential to affect your point of care results. Our primary rule of pathology is that rubbish samples will give you rubbish results. A pathology device cannot fix a blood sample. It will simply analyse what you put in and give you the result. It is always good policy not to run a point of care test if you suspect the sample is not optimal. Even if the collection was difficult and you just want to get a result so you don't have to bleed the patient again. The result will likely be incorrect or misleading and you'll actually be doing your patient your attending and their attending doctor a disservice by proceeding. In fact, blood collection is such an important part of the pre-analytical process that we'll be producing a dedicated seminar in the near future focused purely on blood collection techniques for point of care testing. When it comes to the point of care testing itself, by far the greatest errors occur because an untrained operator has been allowed to access the device. Also, specimens that are collected, allowed to settle, and not mixed again before testing are also a regular cause of inaccurate results. Awareness of the maximum time limit between collection and testing for certain tests is very important, as is putting your glasses on when entering patient information at the machines. So let's take a closer look at some of these issues. The pre-collection phase is where you must check a few important things before collecting your patient's blood. Firstly, are you trained? So here's a group of well-trained staff who are seeing nothing but good results coming their way. Are you not trained? Well, you need to step away from the machine, or I hope you can afford a good lawyer when the judge asks you a few tricky questions about what you did. If you're untrained, please seek out your local civ user or coordinator and get your training done. Have you identified your patient? Do they have an MRN or AUID? If so, be sure to use it. This ensures the test results go straight to the correct patient's EMR. And so for the remainder of this discussion, when I say MRN, I mean MRN or AUID, depending on where in the state you are. If there's no MRN available, use nine nines as a patient ID and send a reconciliation form to pathology so we can steer the results into the correct patient's EMR. In many of our hospitals, specific MRNs are provided during local disasters. In this case, these are the patient IDs to enter as they'll be matched up later by your LHD admin staff. Do not use random patient IDs of any description. We have many, we've had many cases in the past where an apparently random MRN has turned out to be a real MRN and results have appeared in the wrong patient's EMR. Please just don't do it. The other obvious thing to check before you bleed a patient is that the point of care device is in good working order. In the case of a non-functioning or disabled device, ask your local SIP user or coordinator to check it out ASAP. Also, if there's already a line of staff at the machine wielding blood gas syringes, consider holding off on your collection a while so your sample is tested fresh for the best results. It's also a good idea to check that the various testing materials you're going to use have not expired. This includes the syringe or blood tube you are collecting into as they contain heparin, which has a limited shelf life. Uh, as mentioned before, we will look into the collection stage in much greater depth in a later seminar, but there are a few things worth mentioning here. The specimen type collection method and stability of the target analytes is often quite specific. This is not so much of an issue for the larger gas machines where you only really need to run a lithium heparin blood gas syringe within 15 minutes of collection. However, as per this ISTAT testing table, many point of care devices have very specific requirements. We place how-to wall charts at all our point of care testing sites which show you these specifications. So please take the time to familiarise yourself with them if you haven't already. And always contact your super user or coordinator if you have any queries. 
On that note, here are a couple of reminders we keep going on about. As Josh has already discussed, do not store blood gas syringes on ice. And please do not collect into a large plain syringe and transfer the blood to multiple tubes. This will not only prematurely activate the blood's clotting process, the high pressure draw of the larger syringe increases red cell breakage, which is hemolysis. You also risk cross-contamination between the tube's anticoagulants, and you are putting yourself and others at unnecessary risk of blood exposure. It is best practice to always mix your specimens twice. The first time is immediately after collecting to ensure the blood mixes well with the syringe or tube heparin to prevent clotting. The second time is just before you apply the sample to the point of care device. This ensures the sample is fully homogenous when tested. For syringes, we recommend five seconds palm rolling and then five seconds inverting. So that's a full 10 seconds. And here's what 10 seconds of silence sounds like. So is that how long you mix yours for? And if not, you are not mixing enough. The other thing to do with your specimen is to label it with the patient ID and the time of collection. This helps prevent two major issues, knowing which specimen is yours amongst the pile next to the machine and ensuring the specimen is run within the specified time frame. So here's what a good blood gas syringe specimen looks like. Most blood gas syringes are around one to three mil capacity. A good rule of thumb is to collect a minimum of half the syringe half the syringe's capacity. This ensures the ratio of blood to heparin in the syringe is appropriate to prevent clotting. Here is what an aerated or bubbly collection looks like. And I'm sorry it's not the best picture, uh, but do not even bother testing such a specimen. Here is a collection well short of the required volume. This blood will be over heparinized as the amount of heparin in the syringe is designed to anticoagulate optimal blood volumes. Too little blood is in fact a proven cause of high false positive troponins on both the ISTAT and lab analyzers. The syringes of some manufacturers contain what is known as balanced heparin that reacts as a set ratio to the blood actually in the syringe. But in practice, even this does not compensate sufficiently for very low volumes of blood and effects on results are still observed. Here are two syringes that have been collected and stood in a rack for five to 10 minutes. The blood has settled out, separating from the plasma. Depending on which one you use, you would either get a falsely high hemoglobin from the red cell rich end or a falsely low hemoglobin from the plasma end. If, however, you remember to do your second mix, you would not have this problem. And here's what a good blood tube specimen looks like. Every blood tube has an optimal film mark indicated by a black or white line on the side of the tube. As per our previous syringe discussion, collecting insufficient blood into a tube results in overheparinization and potentially compromises your results. And again, allowing the tube contents to settle for too long without mixing will result in a falsely low or high hemoglobin, depending on where in the tube you take the blood from. So moving on to the point of care testing stage, do not share your login code, please. Use the patient's MRN wherever possible. As discussed before, use nine nines if you have no patient ID, but don't forget you will need to send a reconciliation form to pathology. Don't get into the habit of doing nine nines and then not sending that form. We are watching you. Depending on the device being used, further information may need to be added. Firstly, providing the patient's date of birth constitutes the second identifier the pathology labs require from all collections. And put in the sample type where you can, arterial, venous, capillary, etc. This allows the IT system to post the correct reference intervals against the results in the MR to assist accurate results review by your clinicians. After the test is complete, discard the specimen. If there are any questions about the results, it's better to collect a fresh sample for any retesting. And always keep the work area clean and tidy for your colleagues. Did the test fail? Or are there results missing on the printout? Have a close look at your specimen. Is it a good one? Did you mix it thoroughly just before testing? If so, remix and rerun the specimen. If it fails again, collect a fresh one. After this, it's probably something out of your control. Ask your local supervisor or coordinator to investigate. Do the results in no way match the patient's clinical picture? For example, has the patient been experiencing classic cardiac symptoms for 12 hours, yet the point of care testing result is negative? In this case, don't just rerun the same specimen, you'll probably just get the same result. Uh, remember how I said the machines will not fix your specimen. 
Instead, recollect and repeat the test with a fresh specimen. If you get the same result again, this will at least help rule out blood collection technique or specimen handling as the cause of the original unexpected result. In, the, in these cases where the point of care result does not seem to match the clinical picture, send a specimen to your local lab for a second opinion. And just briefly, this is a rather busy table. Uh, one of my favourites, the four horsemen of the pathology apocalypse, describes the primary reasons why blood specimens sent to the lab are rejected. All clinical staff hate being asked to recollect a blood specimen. And believe me, pathology start, staff hate having to ask. But we must do it because the flow and effect of testing suboptimal specimens can easily result in misdiagnosis and mistreatment for our patients. My point in showing you this is to highlight how laboratories have fail-safe methods that prevent testing of suboptimal samples, whereas point-of-care testing is very much dependent on you, the point-of-care operator, getting it right. So firstly, uh, the very large problem of hemolysis is spotted at the lab both visually and by the laboratory machines. Blood samples are centrifuged at the lab and plasma is generally used. If the specimen is hemolyzed, the hemoglobin in the plasma will appear a pink or red colour. The machines also run an internal hemolysis detection algorithm as a backup. These specimens and any results are then rejected and not released. Point of care specimens, however, are whole blood, so visualising hemolysis is not possible. And the simpler point of care devices do not have internal hemolysis algorithms. Secondly, because a request form accompanies bloods to the lab and the blood shoes must be fully labelled, if the request form and the blood do not match, then the order is rejected at that point and testing doesn't proceed. Point of care, however, only requires a patient's ID to be entered at the device and results will be sent automatically to that patient's EMR. The last two issues are around insufficient samples and using incorrect collection tubes we've already discussed. But our reminder that what is screened out of the front end of the laboratory will always be the primary risk of point of care testing. But this risk can be greatly reduced by avoiding shortcuts and carefully following the testing procedures as you have been trained.